This is the uh, original Jerusalem Bible in English. It's based um, largely on a French Bible published in 1956. In fact, its notes and introductions are a translation from the French um, Bible's notes and introductions. The Jerusalem Bible itself was published originally in 1966. In 1968, a reader's edition came out. And you may have seen my review of the reader's edition in Black Sheepskin. In 1985, the New Jerusalem Bible was published. I've yet to review that one. Uh, in 2018, in February, the New Jerusalem Bible, New Testament, and Psalms came out. The full Bible, full RNJB, was supposed to be published in the fall of 2018, but that's been delayed now until next February. So that gives us some time to review the Jerusalem Bible and its newer companion, the New Jerusalem Bible for the full, complete, revised New Jerusalem Bible is published. The uh, book we'll be looking at today is this red hardback. It has a sort of normal hardback binding. Someone owned it in the past and tried to black out uh, the inscription, but it was given as a gift when it was new in December 1967. It has these nice, like, patterned end sheets in it. It has uh, no ribbon marker, but it has somewhat pretty uh, red and cream head and tail bands in it, and clearly it's a sewn binding, as you can tell just from looking there at the signatures. Um, to save time, and uh, so that you don't have to wait till later to see all this kind of material, we're going to jump right into the details now. So you should be seeing charts, and we'll also show you the book as we go through the charts. The uh, Jerusalem Bible is nine and a half inches tall, six and a half inches wide, and three inches thick. The sheet thickness is 62 micrometers, giving you an estimated paper weight of 57 GSM. It's in a single column format, which explains why it's so thick. We really can't read very, very long lines, so that limits the width of the book. And since um, the page can only be so wide, you need more pages. It's a thicker volume to cover all the material in the book. Single column paragraph format. Each column is 111 millimeters wide. There are as many as 84 characters per line and as many as 56 lines of text per column. That is where there are no um, headings or uh, footnotes at the bottom of the page. You can get as many as 56 lines of text. Page dimensions are 234 millimeters tall and 155 millimeters wide, 9.2 inches tall, 6.1 inches wide. Margins at the top of the page are about 15 millimeters. The bottom runs about 17. Inner margin can be as much as 19, that's from the edge of the text into the gutter, not from the edge of the verse numbers. And the outer margin is 26 millimeters, so again from the edge of the text to the outside. You can see here that this particular edition has the thumb, thumb index, thumb indices. The font in the text here is about 9 to 9.5 points, time New Ro times New Roman equivalent. When you compare to Georgia, it's about 8.5 to 9. The line height is about 10.2 pica points. So what I've just observed is if the line height is actually larger than the equivalent times New Roman height, you really have a generous line spacing. And that's what this is here. This makes it very easy to read. Line width is not too wide for me, at least, anyway. Verse numbers come here in the inner margin and the verses are distinguished by a raised dot in the text. Okay, we can say more. The notes at the bottom of the page come in two columns. Each column is about 54 millimeters wide with about 52 characters per line. The notes apply to the left and the right pages but appear only on the right hand page. So, you see nothing there on the left page, but the notes do actually apply to both the left and the right pages. This is something that they've changed in the New Jerusalem Bible, I mean the revised New Jer Jerusalem Bible. The New Jerusalem Bible is still this format, but in the revision, 
that came out this past year, they started moving notes to the left page as well. I wish they had just left it this way. It's distinctive and it has a certain character to it. The font in the notes is small. It's about 6.5 points time New Ro times New Roman equivalent. References are in the outer margin here. And there are little symbols that go with the references that I'll show you here in a minute as we go through the introduction. Things like little triangles, little plus signs, little arrows that go up at a 45 degree angle you'll find here and there. And all of those are explained in different places. Well, in one good place. Um, <clears throat> font in the references is the same as the font in the notes. It's about a 6.5 point times New Roman equivalent. Book titles here are at the center top of the page. The uh, page numbers are in the inside, so near the gutter. And what you have here on the outside is the first um, verse that starts on the left page. And here you have the last verse on the right hand side. Uh, headings are in the text, so you'll see things like this in a bold font. It's about nine points, just as the text is, but it's bold. Uh, groups of books um, are, are collected together for an introduction. So here you see you have the historical books, and there's an introduction to these five, six books seven books, I guess, two of Samuel and two of Kings. So a single introduction there. The multiple books. And then each book of the Bible does start on its own page. Contents of the book are outlined. So here's the first major section, the first major subsection, and then you go on. So here's the second major subsection of Joshua B, the crossing of the Jordan. Uh, the font in the introductions here is a bit larger. It's about a 10-point font. All right, um, so now we'll do the rapid tour through the contents of the Bible. And first, I just want to do some size comparisons with other single-column study Bibles. So here's the Jerusalem Bible with the English Standard Version study Bible kind of hard to get them both in the same scene there. The ESV is a bit taller and a bit wider, but not nearly so thick as the Jerusalem Bible. All right. And here's an older one. This is uh, really a very nice one. It's the old Harper Study Bible and the Revised Standard Version. This is Harold Blenzel's Study Bible. It's shorter and thinner and not so wide. The Harper Study Bible, just like the Jerusalem Bible, is in a single column format. References in the side. Uh, unlike the Jerusalem Bible, it does have the division of the verses, the verse numbers in the text. It also has headings, just like the Jerusalem Bible. So they're very similar, but the Harper Study Bible is quite lightly annotated. So we've been here before. We've seen this page. There's a little sheet here with the Jerusalem Bible on it. Here are the editorial team. Alexander Jones, no known relation, but I think all Joneses are related. In fact, I think all human beings are related. Uh, the only person whose name I recognize here among the editorial team is uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Here's the uh, title page with the Jerusalem cross in the center. This is published by Doubleday and Company in Garden City, New York. And it is printed in the United States of America, as it says on the opposite page. The copyright is by Darton, Longman, and Todd. They also have the copyright to the revised New Jerusalem Bible. The uh, Nihil Obstat and Imprimatur, it is uh, Nothing Stands in the Way and Let It Go Forth, was given in uh, 1966. Cardinal Heenan, and it does notice that the introductions and notes of the Bible are, with minor variations and revisions, a translation of those that appear in La Bible de Jerusalem, which is the French one, 
uh, originally published in 1956. They're looking at the 1961 one-volume edition. The Jerusalem Bible in two uh, editions is uh, famous on Eternal Word Television Network. It's the it's the translation that Mother Angelica is seen using. Here's the editor's foreword. I was hoping to see here that they would tell me which Greek text they use for the New Testament, but they don't. So the Jerusalem Bible is one of the more modern Catholic Bibles that is actually based on the original text rather than the Latin Vulgate. But they don't say which edition of the Greek New Testament they use. We'll take a look a bit at some variants readings that they follow. They use Yahweh in the text rather than uh, Jehovah or the more traditional the Lord. So they mention here they're using Yahweh. And that introduction is from 1966. Here are the contents. It has not only the normal Protestant books, but it has also the deuterocanonical books, such as Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus and the additions to Daniel and Esther. It has Tobit and Judith, all in the normal Roman Catholic order. Supplementary material in the back, that which, we'll, which we will look at closely, or uh, perhaps not so closely, is listed here. List of abbreviations. This is what they use for the book titles. Books in the alphabetical order, and then other abbreviations that they use that aren't commonly used. So uh, LXX for the Septuagint, MT for the Masoretic Text, Theodotion, no, Theodoret. Uh, I thought they meant Theodotion's Greek New Testament. No, but it's Theodoret, who was an early writer. This is kind of interesting. These are the 24 books, 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. And you get to 24 by lumping them in ways that we don't normally do. So first and kings are together as kings. Um, Twelve minor prophets are here as the Twelve Prophets as a single book. There are other groupings that get you down to uh, only 22 books in the Hebrew Bible. I don't remember off the top of my head how exactly one does that. Here are the books of the Greek Bible taken from Rolf's Septuagint. There's kind of a funny line here. It says, with the exception of these apocryphal books, the books that aren't canonical according to the Catholic Church, the content of the Greek Bible is the same as that of the Old Testament accepted by the Church. I'm not sure anybody couldn't say that, <laughs> with, with the exception of the apocryphal books. So um, they do not include, for instance, uh, Third and Four Maccabees, which are in the Septuagint, but they are not in the uh, de amongst the uh, canonical or deuterocanonical books of the Catholic Church. Kind of interesting table. Here's the typographical and reference system that's used, and it mentions that they use italics in the text for quotations. They also use italics in the um, uh, verse numbers for verses that are brought in from the Septuagint. So we mention that here. And then symbols and the uh, biblical references. So we saw the little black triangle earlier. And in some cases, a group of marginal references which begins near the foot of the left-hand page has to be continued at the top of the facing page. So the little black triangle says that the references apply to the previous page. These are symbols that are used for parallel passages, symbols that are used uh, to indicate that there are doublets or parallels with references at the passage cited. So if you go to the passage with the P at the end of it, you'll find other references that are parallel. This indicates that there's either an allusion or a quotation to this verse later or somewhere else in the New Testament. I mean, later, say, in the New Testament as an example. Plus symbol is used at the end of references to indicate that at the point referred to, the reader will find either a note or further references relevant to the passage he's reading. So more information is what plus means, and F means following, that is, and following verses. And you come to the Old Testament, and you have an introduction, 
So here's the introduction to the Pentateuch, an introduction in roughly 10 point type. They talk about higher criticism in here. The way they discuss these issues here, it's really kind of hard to pin them down. It's as if they're deliberately attempting to be non-committal. But they do talk in a sort of an analytical and rationalistic way about the Word of God, to explaining it as if it were a human book. So I tend to ignore that sort of stuff. Here's the way uh, a book is, is formatted. The title in the middle of the page is the text, single column as we've seen, ref, uh, verse numbers in the left-hand column, references in the right, notes at the bottom of the page. All the books in the normal Catholic order. So here are the books of Ma books of Mas Maccabees, the two that they use that are integrated into the text. Psalms, I think, are numbered um, in the normal way here, rather than in the way that's in the Septuagint and the Dewey Reims Bible. Okay, we're going through Jeremiah fast here, Zechariah, the uh, paper, let's talk a little bit about the paper. Paper does have a slight waxiness to it, I don't know if you're catching any of that there, but it's very slight and it's not very noticeable to me, so I've not noticed that I have to move the lamp angle around to try to avoid glare. There's some show through, but this is thick paper, so it's kind of minor. You don't really see much. Uh, it doesn't really matter then that it's not line matched because you have a nice, fairly boldly and darkly printed black ink printed uh, text. And you don't have a lot of show through there, so the fact that it isn't line matched isn't much of a problem. It would be hard to line match to this, all these notes here on the side column as well. Um, there's a little print non-uniformity here and there, but it's minor. I would say that uh, Doubleday did a very good job altogether. Uh, in the New Testament, you see that the words of Christ are printed in black, as they should be, so I'm very pleased with that. Uh, quotations from the Old Testament, let's see if we can find one. Here's one that they say is from Psalm 5.5 5 and Psalm 6.8, and you see that it is in an italic font. So italics is used in the New Testament for quotations from the Old Testament. Flip on through. So we had an introduction to the books of St. Paul as we flip by. Here's the book of Revelation. We come to the end of the book of Revelation. Here, and we come to the supplementary material. So the first thing we see is a chronological table that runs for several pages in parallel column form with the, the date running here in the slender column and then information from various parts of the world lined up about that uh, slender column. Several pages is right. We're just now coming to Vespasian. Okay, so after the chronological table, which ends about 100 AD, let's see, here's an entry for Bishop Mark uh, Ebionites, Gospel of the Hebrews, and that's our final entry. We have a genealogical chart with the Hasmonean and Herodian dynasties. So you can see here a whole, how all the Herods are related in a genealogical tree. Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa, Herod of Chalcis, Herod Agrippa II, and Herod Antipas. The uh, Hebrew calendar the different months and their names and their Macedonian names and the feasts mentioned in the Bible measures and money 
And then here, then, uh, this is quite useful. It's an index of biblical themes in the footnotes. So if you're interested in what the footnotes say about any particular topic, there is some chance that you'll be able to find it here in this index and be able to go back and read the footnotes. Footnotes in this Bible are quite uh, lengthy in, in places, and I find them very useful. I like the way they're formatted. Um, here's the Near East in ancient times. Glossy, as you can see. Kitchen lamp, lamp light there. Very colorful, very yellow. Palestine in the Old Testament. <coughs> Old Testament. Jerusalem. A colorless Egypt. Sinai Peninsula and Palestine at the time of the Exodus. Two maps here on this page. Tribal areas under Joshua in the southern part of the fifth satrap. Satrap. I'm having trouble saying that. Satrapy. Palestine of the New Testament times. Another yellow map. Jerusalem of the New Testament. And then another colorless map. It seems to be upside down. The missionary journeys of Paul that appears, but no title. Oh, title very small down here in the key. We're ready now to do some font comparisons. I just wanted to remark that if there's anything that I would change about this very attractive typeface in the Jerusalem Bible, it's the tracking. Sometimes these letters are just a bit too close together. They are almost touching in certain words. Um, we'll start with the derivative Jerusalem Bible in uh, black sheepskin. Show you the two side by side there. Reader's Edition is on the right. Original Jerusalem Bible is on the left. Uh, actually much nicer over here to the left. Larger, more readable, um, printed more darkly. This is um, Harold Linzel's Harper Study Bible. On the right, and then finally, this is the uh, ESV Study Bible. Quite a massive tome, and it has a bit of yap to it. So let's see if I can get the text of the Bibles together. There we go. More darkly printed on the left. Uh, both have generous line spacing, both perfectly readable. I actually prefer the Jerusalem Bible in this case. Uh, one place where the Jerusalem Bible is somewhat loose is here in 1 Corinthians 12:13. Um, I showed this in my review of the Jerusalem Bible Reader's Edition in Black Sheepskin. This is the verse in which the Jerusalem Bible omits the phrase, uh, in or into one body. We were all baptized into one body. It's a somewhat free translation of the 17 translations I've scored uh, previously. You should be seeing my translation continuum here. It is the most free. Um, I've taken a look, though, at the New Living Translation in a few spots, and I think perhaps if I were to attempt to score it, it would be to the right of the Jerusalem Bible. Now I want to show a few examples of the types of things that they do in the Jerusalem Bible that are less than literal. So we'll take a look at four charts, starting with Matthew 28:15. You see here the kinds of things they've done. They've replaced they with the soldiers. They got rid of a conjunction that starts the phrase that the American Standard Version um, translates as so. I use the American Standard uh, Version because it is rather literal carried out instructions, it replaces, did as they were taught. Um, to this day, this is the story for this saying was spread abroad. So the idea of spreading abroad is just deleted entirely from the Jerusalem Bible. <clears throat> Mark uh, 2.18, some mild things there. They introduced uh, the little pericope with one day when in the Jerusalem Bible, which isn't in the Greek. Um, they replace they with some people. So, uh, little things like that. Titus 2.15 is more extreme. Um, these things speak becomes now this is what you are to say. Uh, and exhort becomes whether you are giving instructions uh, and reprove becomes or correcting errors. 
with all authority it becomes you can do so with full authority and let no man despise thee becomes and no one is to question it so that's uh, an example of it's where it's uh, where the Jerusalem Bible is quite free John 3.29 wraps it up that's our fourth and final example and you can see I was able to highlight here some of the differences well, I, I call the translation free, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. I actually do like the Jerusalem Bible quite a lot. I just don't recommend it as a primary study Bible. and something that you can use that would give you one group of people's interpretation of what the passage means. I like the style a lot. It's um, kind of uh, easygoing and prepositional, and it has a certain character to it that's hard to describe but I do enjoy it. Um, in this part of the video we're going to look at some of the notes, just a few of them. And to start we'll, we'll look at uh, John uh, 1.13 where the Jerusalem Bible uh, assumes a variant reading is true rather than the standard reading that you would find say in the United Bible Society's 5th edition. Um, but to all to, that who did accept him he gave power to become children of God to all who believe in the name of him who was born, not out of human stock or the urge of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the point here is that um, who says who was born. Um, the more common reading that you'll find in translations these days is who were born, that is, of those who believe in him, those who believe in him are born, not of human human stock or the will of the flesh, etc. But there's a variant reading that refers this to Jesus. And we'll just take a look quickly here, if we can get the camera to move over there, to note K on the other column. And you'll get a sense for the way these notes read. And so they say, literally, who was born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man. So they give you a more literal translation. And then they say there's a variant, and the commonly accepted reading is the variant. And it is uh, those who are born not of blood, dot, 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 man. The shorter reading, not of flesh or blood, is perhaps the original one. So they're saying here that they took this, this expression, these um, expressions, to refer to Jesus. I think this is one of those places where a variant reading actually does have theological import because if these words do not refer to Jesus but they refer to the believers then it's saying that the believers when they are born again they're born of the will of God and not of the will of man which tells you something about the character of regeneration however if they refer to Jesus as is uh, the choice made here in the Jerusalem Bible, uh, then it really has no impact for the doctrine of gen regeneration whatsoever, simply telling us about Jesus, not about our regeneration. Okay, here's another interesting bit uh, in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, it's the only Son who is nearest to the Father's heart who has made him known. So they've chosen the only Son reading, which again is uh, a minority reading in the uh, United Bible Society 5th edition. It's uh, the reading that's most common in the Greek manuscripts, but not in the oldest Greek manuscripts. They have uh, God the Only Begotten, and that is what the footnote down here R says as well. Variant God Only Begotten. All right, the next note I want to look at is the note on Romans at 8.29, note Q. So we'll just read uh, verses uh, 8, 28, and 29 in the book of Romans. Uh, we know that by turning everything to their good, God cooperates with all those who love him, with all those that he has called according to his purpose. They are the ones he chose specially long ago and intended to become true images of his Son, so that his son might be the eldest of many brothers. Now there's nothing here in the notes that have to do with uh, the Augustinian heritage of the Catholic Church, the notions of election and predestination, which are 
embedded in the verse, but we will look at Q to see what they do say, if we can accomplish that here. So I think I'm aimed in the right place. So be good. This is what I like about these notes in the Jerusalem Bible, is that they can be read. They have all these references interspersed in them, but they can be read and they make a lot of good sense, and you can learn quite a lot. <clears throat> Christ, the image of God, is the in, in the primordial creation, has now come by a new creation to restore to fallen man the splendor of that image, which has been darkened by sin. He does this by forming man in the still more image, still more splendid image of a son of God. Thus, sound moral judgment is restored to the new man, and also his claim to glory, which he had sacrificed by sin. This glory which Christ, as the image of God, possesses by right, is progressively communicated to the Christian until his body is itself clothed in the image of the heavenly man. So whether you agree with the contents of the note or not, uh, you have to admit that it's uh, very well written, and they attempt to back up everything they claim with verses from Scripture, which you can take your time and study and decide whether you agree with what they're saying or not. As an, a second example of the notes, let's look at uh, the next page, uh, Romans 9.4. Uh, they are descended from the patriarchs, and from their flesh and blood came Christ, who is above all, God forever blessed. Amen. And so the note I want to look at here is note D down below. Let's see if we can arrange that. It's down here at the bottom of the page, that's where it begins. It says both the context and the internal development of the sentence imply that this doxology is addressed to Christ. Paul rarely gives Jesus the title God, though, uh, though, or addresses a doxology to him, but this is because he usually keeps this title for the Father and considers the divine persons not so much with an abstract appreciation of their nature, as with a concrete appreciation of their functions in the process of salvation. And the note goes on and on, and again, here it gives references. He presents Christ as subordinated to the Father, not only in the work of creation, but also in that of eschatological renewal. Uh, nevertheless, the title Lord, received by Christ at his resurrection, is the title given him by the seventy... <coughs> to Yahweh in the Old Testament. So it goes on and on reinforcing the, the concept that Paul is in fact referring to Christ as a member of the Godhead and concludes with, in short, he is one of the three persons enumerated in the Trinitarian formula. Well, I looked uh, as a, for another example of uh, a note that I could share here in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that would discuss faith and works. But as you can see, there is no note there. Let's, uh, let's sum up. Um, I like the Jerusalem Bible translation quite a lot. So one of my pros is the readability of this translation. Although it's loose, and I don't recommend it as a primary study Bible by any means, it's certainly very readable, and it's pleasing aesthetically. Um, it's loose and flowing and prepositional, and if I had a larger vocabulary, I could think of other good words to say about it. I like the detailed notes. The notes tend to stay away from higher criticism uh, that one would find in the introductions to the books, at least my experience. Perhaps I haven't studied them closely enough. But they tend to simply be informative, and some of them are quite uh, deep theologically, as we saw just a moment ago. On the downside, I would say that one of the major negatives is that this book is huge. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to be able to curl up in bed with. Fortunately, there are smaller versions, like the Reader's Edition. Uh, this, although it was printed in 1966, it's still available. You can still find this in, on Amazon. You can still find it quite frequently on eBay. The other negative I would point out is the 
the traces of uh, unbelievism, uh, the uh, higher criticism and uh, taking the human attitude towards the scriptures of uh, putting ourselves in the, in the position of being judges over the scripture rather than doing as St. Augustine did, uh, saying wherever we don't understand anything in the scripture where it appears to be contradicting itself or to be in contradiction with facts that we know, we give it the benefit of the doubt because we are limited, finite human beings and there's a lot that we do simply do not know. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, I hope it's not too long, review of uh, the Jerusalem Bible. If you did, please remember to like and uh, feel free to subscribe to this channel. Thanks very much for watching.